Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, my name is Anna Hausman from Riverside Insights and we're so thrilled to invite or to have you join us today for um, our summer conversation series for educators by educators. Um, this is our third in a series of six conversations throughout the summer that are really highlighting topics that are front and center to your mind, uh, um, on your mind in, in the classroom, in schools, in districts that we really wanted to you know, discuss and, and get, share insights from our perspective, get your insights about. And so we're really excited um, to have you join us today for a discussion on how to best support English language learners. Um, so today I'm joined by three of my exceptional colleagues that have extensive experience um, supporting English learners in the classroom and really excited to um, have them introduce themselves shortly and then talk to them about kind of what are some of their practical strategies for, in, for ensuring that all English language learners and all diverse learners in the classroom are supported um, and, and really, you know, have the environments to thrive. Um, so we'll jump into discussion shortly and I'll let them, I'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to highlight the upcoming um, for educators by educators conversations that we have. Um, so we have three more after this, sorry, four more after this. Um, it's a series of seven conversations. Next week we'll have addressing external influences in social emotional learning, followed by July 20th being creative and amplifying student potential. July 27th, building the bridge between special ed and general education, and then August 3rd, advancing equity in your classroom. So if these are conversations that are of interest to you, we encourage you um, to register for them. Um, and so that, or, and, and um, you'll get, even if you can't attend live, you'll get the recording. Um, but without further ado, let me stop sharing my screen. Um, I'd like to kick it over to my colleagues to introduce themselves uh, specifically, you know, what their background is and why they care about this topic of supporting English language learners in the classroom. So, uh, Rob, would you mind kicking it off for us? Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Dyson, and I was a science teacher for 20 years in Texas, mostly secondary, grades 6 through 12. And I also worked as an assessment and curriculum consultant for 14 years. I, I would say my passion of working with English learners and multilingual students is really what most teachers have, and that's that I wanted every student to be successful. And whatever supports the student needed, I wanted to, to do my best to provide those supports. And uh, also, it's just so rewarding to see a newcomer come to your school, starting sometimes with, with very minimal language skills in English, and see them grow with their language and make friends and just be successful in school. It, it's it's very rewarding to see that. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, Ronnie, over to you. Hey, everybody. I'm Ronnie McClinahan, and I served in the public school arena for 28 years. Uh, half of those years, I was um, basically an English and writing teacher. Um, and in that role, I seem to have... Um, mostly non-traditional non learners. Um, I served ESL students and um, many other special populations, but also the second half of my career, I was in the specialist position for gifted and talented and ESL in those two um, roles. And so ESL I'm passionate about, not only because I live in Texas and, and it's we have ESL is a, is a big deal in all of our schools in Texas, but I also was a second language learner for a while. Um, people don't know this about me, that I lived in South Africa for two years as a teenager. My father built um, oil refineries and coal gasification plants. And so I found myself in South Africa in a school of 1300 with only 10 of us who were English speakers. And so um, it was, I can really resonate with my second language learners because I know how that feels. But again, my passion has really been the special populations. Those have been where I really was thriving the most in all those 28 years. So I uh, love education, love teachers, and that's uh, just kind of my thing, ESL and special pops. Thanks, Ronnie. Yes, um, Sarah, yeah. over to you. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Holman, and I spent uh, 21 years in public education leaving the field just last October. Um, I worked as a bilingual education teacher for about eight years, 
And then I transitioned into an educational diagnostician role where I continued to conduct sort of assessments for ELs. That was a major part of my responsibility. Um, I've always, had, those kiddos have always had my heart and I really just love the idea of, I taught littles, I taught pre-K, kindergarten and first grade and I just love the idea of fostering in them a real pride in the fact that they were bringing this amazing gift of bilingualism to the world and really wanted to make sure that they valued that and saw themselves as, as unique and um, something that not everybody had. Um, I kind of related to them. I was a Peace Corps volunteer, um, so I learned Spanish as a second language almost as an adult, and so it gave us some common ground and helped me identify a little bit with what they may be going through and really wanting to um, give them opportunities to show their unique talents and really take on the world multilingually. Amazing. Well, we have three incredible experts on the call right here with, you know, decades of experience teaching um, students from, from different backgrounds and English language learners and really excited to gain your expertise today and, and hopefully share some best practices that educators across the country can implement um, in, in their classrooms. Before we get started, we actually have a quick poll for everyone um, that I am going to launch. Um, and so I, the poll should be open, but we are curious about how you are currently supporting your English learners, um, whether you are doing a push-in program, a pull-out program, a combination of both, or if there's another way that you're supporting your learners, if you wouldn't mind just entering that in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to give it just a couple more minutes to see some responses coming in heavily. Um, most people are using some sort of combination program where they're doing a push, where they're doing push in and pull out. Um, let me give it about 30 more seconds. All right. So you should see now the, the results of the poll where, you know, the majority of people are doing some sort of combination of push in and pull out program. Um, if you selected other, if you wouldn't mind sharing in the Q&A chat, you should see the Q&A chat on your webinar screen. You know, how else you're supporting your English language learners in the classroom um, or in school on a daily basis. Um, and then for those of you that are doing a combination program, would love to hear a little bit more if you if you could just type it into the chat or the Q&A about, you know, how you're structuring your, your combination program, like how often are students getting push-in services or pull-out services um and and um any best practices you have to share with kind of structuring that combination program so we just wanted to kick it off with with kind of getting a little bit of a glimpse into how you are supporting your students um but to start our conversation rob i would love to learn a little bit about i, I know we've talked kind of offline about um different strengths that we've recently seen in language instruction we've made a lot of progress in language instruction we obviously have you know ways to go but would love to learn a little bit about from your perspective on on what we've done well recently with improving language instruction for our students sure uh, for me personally i think one of the greatest strengths that i'm seeing is just from the education community itself over the last several years i've just seen so many great examples of leadership uh, among individuals across the country and also associations organizations our state does are, are putting out great resources for supporting english learners and multilingual students and and i feel like there's just so much excitement there's several people i follow on twitter where, where daily i'm just getting great ideas on, on supporting our students and I just think that's one of the strengths is the excitement and and commitment uh, across the country. Um, Ronnie, do you think or do you have any other ideas of kind of you know where we have um, become stronger with language instruction over the past couple of years, or even like where where we have additional opportunities to grow? Sure. Um, well, one of my passions was writing, and so. Um, you know, one of the biggest trends in education, as you all know, is that writing across the curriculum, writing workshop. I was a writing workshop trainer, mentor, teacher, and loved all of that. And so I used writing quite a bit with my L's, and I feel like it was very successful um, writing in all of their classes. And I was kind of an advocate for um, and an intermediary for them when they were falling behind in class. You know, we use that writing tool to see what they learn. So I think really the inclusion of writing is majorly important. 
And uh, one of the quotes, uh, this one, my favorite, Pat Stephen, um, who is it? I can't think right now, said, Stephen, I can't even think right now who I'm talking about, but one of the famous people said, um, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? And so I use that with my kids that, you know, try to think and write, think and write. So that's very successful across curriculum. But one of the most successful things that we did was um, we created a list of multiple meaning words as a team we got together. And where that came in handy is that we took the word, say, plot. The math, science, social studies, and English teachers all got together. And we said, okay, this, this nine weeks or this six weeks or this quarter, let's come up with 20 or 30 words that they're all going to learn. And these are words that have multiple meanings across each class. So plot. Well, in the English class, I'm talking about plot, character, setting, and theme. In the history class, they're talking about a plot of land. And in the math class, they're talking about plot this on a graph. So just isolating some of those words, the academic vocabulary that the kids are going to hear and helping them with that little pool of words made a huge difference. And so I would encourage that plus writing um, as often as we can. So Stephen King said, Stephen, Stephen King, King said, how do I know what I think until I see what I say? I'm like, who is that? <laughs> So those are some really interesting suggestions and I taught um, I taught kindergarten as well and just even helping the students you know with in the with the with the littles like identifying the word with an image next to it and helping them associate the different words with different visualizations was also really helpful in the classroom very much so, so. Sarah what what I know that you have you know substantial experience both on like the diagnostician side and in the classroom what opportunities do you think still exist in our instruction of english language learners and where do you think we need to continue to improve our instruction or our assessment in order to support our instruction yeah i think there's some potentials on sort of the the broader systemic um sort of structures of the school system where we can, I always found as a bilingual teacher that some of the professional development that was put on by the districts sort of had second language learners or particularly bilingual educators sort of as, a, as an afterthought. We would get these great professional development, but the application piece and how that might look differently in a bilingual classroom or it, when you're instructing, you know, students are learning English as a second language, some of those considerations weren't always at the forefront. And so I think systemically there are opportunities for administrators, district um, officials to sort of keep in mind when they're planning professional development for teachers to make sure that we're differentiating the approaches for the different um, groups. And then I think also at, at sort of the classroom level, a similar application is, is appropriate where we're looking at differentiating our, our instruction by reading level or certain curricular concepts that the student may be um, deficient in, but adding that extra layer of English language proficiency onto those grouping strategies or those instructional strategies within your small group setting is really important. So yeah, although a, a group of students may need extra support on reading comprehension or plot analysis, layering over their level of English language proficiency and what supports they might need as a result of that, I think is an important consideration um, as well. How do you, like building off of that, Sarah, how do you measure in an equitable manner English language proficiency? And how do you ensure that you're not, that you are, you know, assessing true English language proficiency and not, um, you know, and not like a learning, a learning issue or something like that? Yeah, so I think it requires building sort of a, a, a comprehensive linguistic profile of the student. Standardized assessments of, of language proficiency are one component of that. I think they're a very important component of that. But it also involves looking at the student's linguistic backgrounds, their exposure, what language or languages do they speak at home, with whom do they speak those languages, um, what about you know in school in different situations, looking at not just formal testing scores, but build, building a more comprehensive picture in order to determine, you know, where their strengths and weaknesses lie in their in their language abilities. Can I add something to that? Please. So also the importance of having that one adult on a campus that will develop a relationship with that child. 
for various reasons. Um, it's something as simple as, um, say, the teacher who who's talking while she's writing on the board. That child might be more proficient than we realize, but because the teacher's facing the board and not facing the child when he or she speaks, you know, one of the exercises they did with us at a training was um, they started speaking in Italian and they're, they were facing the board. So we couldn't see the lips move. We couldn't see anything they were saying. All we were just hearing was, it sounded like gibberish to us because we didn't totally, we would catch a word ever so often, pizza, spaghetti that we knew, you know, but just those little techniques of the teachers being aware of who's in the room and speaking in a, you know, to the children so that they can see. And sometimes, sometimes we're not evaluating them appropriately unless you have that one adult who under, that has the relationship with the kid that can say, no, he's hearing you, he's understanding you, but we need for you to do, you know, look at the child when you speak and that sort of thing. So I think it helps to have that one adult that would develop a, a relationship with the child on campus. And we did that by having mixed level classes. So we would have English class that had sixth, seventh and eighth graders in it. So the child got to know me or whoever that person was for a couple of years. And then that would just help to, to um, maybe be the correct, the correct assessment of how much the child knows, you know, if you have a, if you have a different teacher every year, that may not be as clear. So. I think uh, that, I think that, I'm sorry. Um, no. the, the element that I think was sort of underlying what you're saying a little bit was that element of trust. Like language learning is a very vulnerable state for a lot yeah. of our kids. And I taught little kids and their effective barrier was almost non-existent. However, as they get older, there right. does become that barrier of putting themselves out there. And so establishing that trust and establishing your classroom as a place that's safe for them to try and experiment and get that corrective feedback and, and receive that comprehensible input that allows them to make meaning of what's going on around them is, is really, really crucial. Yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that too. It's just real important, that whole social emotional piece with the trustworthy adult for the child. Absolutely, absolutely. That's actually one of the things I'm hearing from the education community on social media that's so exciting is, is how to affirm student culture and the importance of affirming student culture and identity because based on you know, exactly what Dr. Holman's saying, it, language is vulnerable. It takes risk to practice speaking with others. And the best way to improve on your language, your listening uh, domain, is for students to engage in conversations with, uh, you know, I hate to use the word native English speakers, but uh, other students who, who their first language is English, that's where they really sharpen their, their, their listening skills, which is oftentimes a weak component on language proficiency tests, because it's not easy to listen to a, a second language and, and comprehend well. So that, thanks. One of the things that we did even in the classroom, so I taught elementary and middle school is, um, and this kind of built a, built a culture of trust for all students, um, is encourage students to, we call it track the speaker, but encourage students to literally turn their body and look at the speaker or look at whomever was talking. And so their full attention was then directed at that student talking. And even that little act of like turning your body to, to make eye contact with the person talking, built this culture of respect for who, for, you know, for, for listening to different voices in the room. Um, and, um, you know, we incorporated a lot of sign language in our classroom as well. So even the little kids, the, the kindergartners, you know, if they agreed with something, they would go me too, or they would say build on. And so then we would start to create this culture of like listening and responding instead of just trying to come up with your next thing to say or, um, you know, in, in, um, focusing on something else other than what the person was sharing. It's good. And I think that extends to working with parents as well, because, you know, a lot of times if you're if you have students in your classroom, you may be instructing in English, they may be able to in English, but they mean it may not be the case of the parents. And sort of directing your attention and speaking to the parents rather than if you're involved, you have a translator there, an interpreter there, speaking to the interpreter, but having them having them be actively involved in, in, in feeling like they are an essential component of their child's education. I think that starts with 
just those little things of directing your attention, directing your communication to them. If I could add to that, Dr. Holman, uh, creating that culture of trust, I, I think with districts where, where we have maybe over 100 different languages spoken, just having a teacher ask a student to, to show them how to say hello in that language. And then when we meet the parent, you know, trying to say that word hello and then even engaging the child. Did I did I get that right? You know, and then say your 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 son or your daughter taught me that. And then I, I just think that whole culture of trust and learning from each other is just so important. It, it's exciting. It is, and I'll add one thing that we did that was so much fun every year, and we like to do it around Thanksgiving, was uh, we would invite all of the parents of our ESL students. And we would have, um, and they would bring something, a food from their culture, and we would all have a meal together, and then we would learn about something from their culture. So that was, uh, it was really a tug on the heart with the parents and with us, because it was really just kind of solidified our friendship. So that's a wonderful thing to do in your community. Yeah, I love that. So building trust is essential, obviously, for, for all students, but especially for our students that are learning English and, and um, that may not feel as confident with the English language. What about how, you know, especially coming out of COVID, we're seeing a lot of changing demographics in many districts. We're seeing people leaving cities, moving to suburbs and vice versa. And so there are a lot of districts that we've heard from that are inundated now with English language learners and they haven't they haven't been they haven't they don't have the experience teaching English language learners what would you say to a school as what are some practical tips to support English language learners academically in the classroom like how do you ensure that they are getting the instruction that they need we've talked about kind of the, the word walls and um and, and things like that but what are some other practical tips that, that you incorporated in your classrooms well, we had a period of the day where they would come back to me and it was like a study hall but it was and i actually would go to some of their classes when they needed me so maybe that dedicated period each day where where a dedicated teacher can can say okay what's due what did you do you know what did you turn in what do you still need help on um again just having an adult another adult or another person be eyes and ears for that child who may not really may not even know what they don't what they're missing right so an advocate for the child is necessary if if i was a school administrator that was experiencing a a rapid demographic shift where suddenly i have a lot more uh language learners than than we did you know the year before or whatever i would try to to convey within my, all of my gen ed you know teachers that part of the big part of learning is acquiring the academic language and and then you know providing my teachers with the tools to do a, a better job of, of language acquisition and, and things like explicit instruction of vocabulary showing them play, prayer models and 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 all of these different ways of helping students learn vocabulary and, and just convey that that we're trying to increase language and academic language for all students but our english learners need a few more supports in, in addition and i would approach it that way so it doesn't feel like it's it's a, a heavy lift because it really isn't and going back to what dr holman said earlier about pulling in the, the teachers from the language department as a gen ed teacher when I learn about the strategies that are being used in the ESL and dual language departments, it makes me a better gen ed teacher. And, and that's how I would approach it with, with the schools that are seeing quick changes. Yeah, I had the advantage of being able to teach in Spanish and use Spanish as a foundation to then, you know, pretty much label the English. Once they understood the concept, it just became a question of giving them the label of in English. Um, but I also found with my kiddos that consistency was key. If they knew what to expect and they were able to sort of follow the routine of the classroom, they were able to acquire and, and sort of make sense of some of the words that I was using and associate them with the activity that they were doing. So consistency was huge. 
And then I think in terms of, um, you know, general strategies, a lot of the strategies that we want to use with our ELs are appropriate for all sorts of kinds of learners. So kiddos that have learning difficulties, um, et cetera. So it's not something, you know, radically different um, in a lot of cases than what you may be doing. It just is uh, involves a little bit of adaptation particular to ELs, but it's it's not sort of a radical departure from what you're used to doing in terms of differentiating your instruction. Well, I wanna piggyback on that too. Um, because we have so many electronic tools available to us and most of the kids have a device with them. They either have a phone or they have an iPad or something. So I would say, you know, where you can break the rule, we, we did break the rule with our L's and we said, okay, this child can have his or her phone out. We're not going to, not going to receive phone calls, not, not going to text message, but that child was able to use Google translate. And of course we did quizlets and we did, um, quiz is and just different different tools where we could input that vocabulary and quiz the child on the side and just um, I think those electronic tools are so readily available that we should free ourselves to be able to use those with our L's. Absolutely. Yeah, as a former biology teacher, I always felt like that was the hardest part of biology was just acquiring the language. And I did use Quizlet a lot, basically explicit instruction of vocabulary. That's what really saved me and my students in, in biology. And uh, there was something else I was going to say about that. Um, you know, the word study, you know, all of those things, but but definitely the, those electronic tools like you're talking about helps helps tremendously. And I'll think of the other in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sarah, you brought up a really good point about, you know, good teaching for, for ELLs is, is good teaching for all students. Um, and one of the things I've been thinking about a lot is for all students, specific, especially like coming back off the onset of, or after COVID and re-entering the classroom, like the importance of bringing out students' strengths and helping students understand what they're good at um, and helping students feel empowered to, um, to, to, to know their strengths and leverage their strengths in the classroom. What are some strategies for for ensuring that you help students, specifically students that are, you know, English language learners, diverse learners, um, understand their strengths and, and especially like they're they are inundated with so many, you know, challenges on a daily basis to just acquire the new information and try and translate it to another language. Like how would you as an educator empower those students to understand and identify their strengths and then leverage their strengths in the classroom? open to anyone that's a good question I, I love again affirming culture I love allowing students to write and in, in their their first language and and express the visuals and, and even if there's an assignment you know compare and contrast whatever if they want to use uh, situations and examples of, of the country they live in I, I think just allowing them to keep their identity and I don't know if that's exactly what you're wanting but uh, I'm just no, I think that's a great point. That's a great point. Well, and one of the things that we would do and, and was actually recommended was, as Rob said, let them write in their native language. And so to the English teachers out there, um, you know, we would, we would journal every day. And so the L's were able to journal in their native language, but we would push them just a little bit and say, now, you know, take one or two of those entries and start translating it. You know, help me understand what you're saying. So, you know, sometimes they need to process that first. So let them get it out in their native language, but then give them an opportunity or maybe extra, just extra time to go home and say what they know in science or history. Put that now in English, but go ahead and write what you know in your language. So in your native language. I think also related to that is sort of recognizing that they, a student may have different levels of proficiency in different areas. So their listening ability, for example, may be very strong, whereas their, their written ability may be weaker, or they may be very outgoing, extroverted, and so they, they speak a lot, and so that's a real area of strength. So sort of customizing how they can demonstrate what they know based on their different areas of of more or less proficiency and sort of designing your instruction to play to those strengths while reinforcing those areas that may need a little bit more work. Great point, Sarah. Um, and it kind of 
leads me to to another question of, you know, I think with, with all of our diverse learners or English learners, we've seen trends of overdiagnosing or assuming that, you know, students, if students are struggling on an assessment or a piece of work, that it might be a learning issue. How do we deter, how do we ensure that we're really understanding that student's true language proficiency and like true learning ability so that we can differentiate between whether a student has a, you know, lack of language confidence or a learning issue and then provide them the necessary support and differentiation in the classroom. Yeah, that's like the million dollar question, right? So we want to make sure that we're intervening early enough to get them any any remediation or or instructional programming that they may need at the same time giving them time and recognition that they are still acquiring a language and that does take many many years. So it is a it's a balancing act and you know my sort of guidelines were looking at what would be typically expected within, you know, giving some leeway for individual differences, but sort of what would I expect a, for a student with a, a similar linguistic background, academic exposure? Does their performance differ substantially from the other kids in their classroom with similar experiences? And using that sort of that peer comparison as one of my markers on whether or not, okay, this is within what would be expected. They may be just delayed a little bit in their language acquisition, but it's it's not anything necessarily tremendously outside of the the ordinary, or are we really looking at someone that, you know, taking everything into consideration um, and allowing for those individual differences and that lengthy acquisition process that we're still struggling um, to acquire the skills to be successful. If, if I can add to that, you know, as we, as we look at, um, placement to receive special education services and things like that. The question, has the child received instruction, uh, quality stru instruction is, is so important. And I think, and that just takes me back to creating that climate in campuses that we're all language teachers. Uh, we're mm -hmm. all helping our, our children, you know, acquire language and, and have explicit instruction and vocabulary. And then where I'm going with this is, a child will be a poor reader if their vocabulary is low. And to help students acquire vocabulary, they need multiple exposures of, of those vocabulary words. And, and, and we do that in, in our gen ed classrooms, but I think just becoming more intentional that we are providing students with multiple exposures of these important words, these academic language words, and as they get that, their reading comprehension will also improve. And 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 I say that because reading is really the the biggest. Uh, and help me, Dr. Holman. But when we classify students into special education services, it, reading is is the largest uh, category of that. So. Yeah, and I want to piggyback on what Rob's saying too. And again, that goes back to the importance of having a single adult and maybe a period of the day where the child goes to this other sacred kind of class where we can pull out the children's books and we can we can give a children's book to an eighth grader and we can actually just sit down and read that basic children's book language you can't do that to an eighth grader in a regular class with you know all these other eighth graders who are reading higher level books but if you have that safe zone that place where they can go every day then that's where we can sit there and read on that lower level and learn all that basic language it's a, and also just the whole importance of having that place that is a comfortable place for that child because learning is hard and they've been in six classes today or seven classes where their brain has been on 110 percent overload so they've got to have that place where they can go and and unwind and take things at their own speed with an adult that they can trust. So. 100%. Um, well, believe it or not, we're closely approaching the end of our time. I know this time flies by, but um, you know, we've talked about building a culture of trust. We've talked about that, having that you know, adult that can check in on students. We've talked about building the right systems from an assessment or observation or classroom instruction perspective so that you can ensure that your students are that you're really individually meeting meeting their needs. Um, any last minute thoughts 
um, as we close out. Um, and, and while while we're kind of doing some last minute thoughts, we'd love for anyone from the audience to drop in the Q&A, what strategies did we miss? Like, what are some practical tips that you have um, that you want to share share out with us that we can, you know, shout out to, to the broader group? How do you support your English language learners in the classroom? Um, and, and what strategies have you found to be very effective? Um, Tiffany, thanks for your comment. Um, you just shared that they have many conversations about the topic of ELs and students with disabilities, and then that that's a really tricky question to figure out and assess. Um, and it is, and, and, and I think we have, you know, I think Dr. Dr. Sarah's comments about understanding kind of what students are, are capable of and then and, and understanding whether or not, you know, whether it's a language issue or a learning issue, that, like building the right systems to understand that students' um, true strengths are going to really help you differentiate whether or not that student needs language support or learning support. Um, so any last minute comments from from either the audience or from you know this group of experts on what um, what other practical tips have we missed? Like what else would help you support in the classroom, support your English learners in the classroom? Michelle just chimed in and said, I use teamwork. Each student pairs up and allows them to express the meaning of each English word. So great. That's a great comment, Michelle. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, peers in the classroom are often an untapped resource, right? And so I think anytime you're, you know, you're sometimes more likely to be open with a, a peer or a friend than you would be with an adult. And so using those, those kiddos as a resource in the classroom, I think is very effective. And I would just reiterate what Rob said in terms of that explicit direct instruction. I think so, so many times we're operating on a sort of a culture of assumptions. We're assuming the kids know how to summarize. We're assuming they know how to do these things. And it's a benefit to all students if we can stop and really make sure that we are being direct and explicit in our instruction of not just vocabulary, but all, all, all sorts of concepts in the curriculum. And Rob mentioned when we were chatting about this before we started today, the importance of sentence stems. Um, really every every academic teacher could use and utilize those sentence stems for your L's to greatly relieve some of the pressure on them to respond in class. On, on my exams, there were about six or seven questions that were straight vocabulary, and my students were allowed to look at the word wall to, to answer those questions. I intentionally did that so they would look at my word wall at least once a week. <laughs> No, that's so smart. Um, Angela just shared identifying twice exceptional for EL is a longer than desired process. Um, yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, and I think that's where, you know, especially understanding what your students are are capable of and understanding their strengths is kind of a first step is really helpful to, to figuring out, you know, that that level of twice exceptionality. Um, Tiffany said, that kindergarten class, we use the turn and talk approach a lot with STEMs. We also have an adult sit with students to help support language. So it's a great idea as well. Um, and music, at least with the littles, they love music. We had a whole music and movement section of our day every day. And that was that was huge for them. They loved that. That's a great point. As a, as a teacher of the old kids, they still love what they did as little kids. So, so yes, music, well, they also yeah. enjoy just music in the classroom. Like we had yeah. just, you know, coffee shop kind of music in the classroom. It was such a de-stressor for them. So amazing. Well, on that note, I'm going to have to conclude us. Um, thank you so much for, for your insights, your experience, your expertise. Um, truly, this is a top-notch group of educators right here, and I'm so grateful to get to work with you all and learn from you all on a daily basis. But um, thank you to the audience for engaging um, and for your, your thoughts and your best practices that you dropped in the Q&A. Um, and we really appreciate you taking the time to join our For Educators by Educators uh, conversation series today. Um, if you have you know, if you're interested in any of the upcoming topics, please, please register or so that you can at least get the recording. But um, we're really excited to continue highlighting these issues and topics that are really front of mind to you in the classroom. Um, so with without with that, um, I'm going to conclude us for today. But I hope you all have a great rest of your day and great rest of your week um, and look forward to hopefully seeing you next Wednesday for our next conversation. All right. Take care, everyone. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Bye.